Buddy Turnstone is a Harrisburg-based indie rock artist. His new single, I've Been to the Dungeon Before, is an epic, moody, but catchy piece of music that features guest vocals from Jessica Boyer and violin from Robin Chambers. Out now on all streaming platforms. Hello everybody, my name is Corey Rosen, and you're listening to The Story Podcast. Today I have on a super awesome guest, Mr. J.C. Fetlock. Hello, Corey, thank you. Of course. Born in 1952 in Hankerstown, Maryland, J.C. Fetlock's first musical instruction was from his mother in the front seat of the car, telling him to shut up while he was singing. J.C. then picked up the flute in fourth grade, influenced by Motown Sound, James Brown, Temptation, Smokey, and the Beatles, J.C. was hooked on rock and roll and has been ever since. After high school, J.C. hitchhiked around the USA for three years. He got a cap of guitar in D.C. pawn shop for only 25 bucks and had a cheap flute. He would find bamboo and make and sell bamboo bongos for fun and profit, then go whichever way his ride was going. Hitchhiking showed him all sorts of people, places, and music. This led J.C. to find... Finding a, a genuine Indian guru, which changed his life forever. He's met people from all over the world, all kinds of music. JC has always wanted his music to contain light, love, nature, and laughter. JC has ran countless open mics, jam sessions, and has mentored many young musicians, many young musicians, including Trey Alexander. Oh my goodness! Currently. JC is working in a program for music for everyone that gets U.S. veterans who have written words to team up with musicians and make songs out of their experiences. They spend a year working on it, then put on a show on Veterans Day at the Ware Center. JC also has a band that writes all original music full of a bunch of old dudes like himself called Wild Self. His latest album is called Love Bomb and has some of the best musicians that he knows of on it. And it is a statement of the great Lancaster producers, mixers, and masters. And there is a lot more to come. JC, how are you doing today? Wow, I'm doing great, Corey. Thank you for having me here today. This is fun. Of course, so, man. So <clears throat> tell me, you you uh you uh obviously you were singing at a very young age for your mother to say, Hey, shut up, I need to pay attention here. I don't <laughs> know if it was time to technically singing you know i think it's a pretty common thing for the kid to be in the back seat Just babbling. And, and the adults in the front yeah <laughs> yo yo come on <laughs> <laughs> yeah so when did stuff start getting serious for you uh, in regards to music you, you picked up a flute in fourth grade surely it wasn't your pan flute they use now no i tell you what i actually have a memory of where I hadn't yet seen like a guitar or a piano or anything yet and hearing music and somehow really going, what is that? And I want to do that, but I didn't even know how you did it. You mm -hmm. know? And I, that's being really, really young when you have a memory, a thought like that, but uh, it started then. So it, you, uh, you take your flute in fourth grade and you go in the band, you know, the, Everybody else was in fourth grade. Right, yeah, of know. course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, Mary Had a Little Lamb, John Philip Sousa. Was, that must have been great, uh, John Philip Sousa at that time, because that's when... Or whatever, I, 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 I wonder what we did play. I don't actually recall. I mean, I remember getting on the stage in front of all the other grade schoolers and playing Mary Had a Little Lamb and some other similar thing. I'm sure it sounded great. And I don't, <laughs> yeah, it probably was, it was probably mind melting. It was so good. <laughs> no, I remember just doing it. And when I look back on it and you see what a fourth grader sounds like. <laughs> you know? So when do you take it to the next step of, oh, I, this is something I can do. I want to actually do. You know, you hear this all the time from people who are like famous and making hit records and everything. But when you saw Elvis on TV and I saw the Beatles, I'm the age where when the Beatles were on TV for the first time, I was in like eighth grade. And it was like. You witnessed I, the British invasion. We didn't know how what a big deal it was. We just really, really liked it. You yeah, know I mean, right. I mean, I, that, you can't put it in terms like I knew history. <laughs> you know, yeah, you didn't know anything. It was just like this was cool. 
it was the first thing in in my world that was like really cool or something like that it was the not just the beatles but the whole I mean, the whole scene. Because I was in the Mo, like Motown before the Beatles. Oh, okay. and even the Monkees. I like the Monkees better than the Beatles till like a certain point, you know. So when did you decide that's on, is that when you decided in eighth grade that you like I want to do that? Just want to be a rock. You star. know, you didn't. I didn't think of things like my future self, <laughs> and what I was going to do for a living, and what I want to do. I just would sing along with it and mm. enjoy it. And it was my number one. Well, I was also into like fishing and nature and sports and stuff too, but music was a big one. So did you start writing stuff at that point or did you? First time I remember writing stuff, I was probably in 10th grade. And that's when I made up the name J.C. Fetlock. Mm. In fact, it started out C.J. Fetlock. And it was about, I used to draw comics, like comic strips. And I just thought, Pat Coon, that's not the name for a comic. You know, this is a 10th grade ego here. <laughs> you know, it's you're, for those doing the arithmetic, it's 1968 when I became J.C. Fetlock. In the beginning, it was C.J. And then I went a while without using it, and I forgot, and I did something, and it became J.C. just out of, you know, forgetfulness. Mm -hmm. No one ever called me C.J., but people started calling me J.C., and I can't explain it, but I'm 71 now, and they still call me JC. And uh, it doesn't really mean anything, you know? That's really funny. Yeah. It's the alter ego you made up as a kid. And you're yeah. Like... <laughs> and just because I thought uh, my real name didn't sound appropriate to be a comic strip artist. Because I mm -hmm. thought maybe before music, I thought maybe I'd be a comic, you know, guy in the newspapers with my comic every day. That's really fascinating yeah i had a characters and everything that i used to draw all the time and everything and i i don't remember exactly when i quit doing it but music took over yeah how did it take over in what ways you started uh, i you... think the first time i got on a stage and actually sang with a band uh it changed my focus so when, when but the thing that? about drawing, you can just oh, sit there. You can be in your room, and nobody has to talk. You don't have to have other musicians. And I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, no, it's good. <clears throat> I'm, I'm saying, uh, when you when was the first time you stepped on the stage? What, was it your own band, or was it just a cover band, or what was what were you doing at that time? I went to Milton Hershey School. Did I already okay. say that? I know you know from reading my thing. I don't know if. I, we've said it today, but uh, it, you live there. You don't live at home. You know, you actually live at Milton Hershey School, and we have this one day a year called Mother. It's a, it's at Mother's Day where we have an assembly in high school, and it's like a talent show, and our parents are actually there, and that doesn't happen ever except that day. And I got up there with, you know, my classmates, and we did um, – the unknown soldier by the doors mm. and it was horrible i mean it was worse <laughs> worse than my fourth grade flute renditions <laughs> and uh maybe it wasn't that bad because they they all applauded and it, it filled the room with the sound of applause and that feeling right there where it was my job at that moment to take the microphone stand and put it for the next act somewhere you know and i remember when I was doing that, going, wow, you know, that. And yeah, you hear that a lot from people. Yeah, thank God for parents that would support their kids no matter how they sound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's who's to blame, everybody, right there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so you started writing your own songs in the 10th grade, you said it was? Yeah, and, and back then, I, I wrote this whole fake album you know, it was based on um, what I saw the Who do with Tommy. And I made up this whole thing about a Vietnam guy, guy, guy like me, but he got drafted, went to Vietnam, and I forget what all happened, but every song was about that. I remember one being about the M16 and leaving home, you know, the scary things of war. Right. And uh, I had this imaginary band I draw on. Album cover, in fact, the album cover was, we took drafting, which was supposed to be mechanical drawing where you draw a house and all, you know. 
And uh, instead of doing what I, what I was supposed to, I drew my fake album cover for the fake band <laughs> and failed the project. Who cares, right? <laughs> <laughs> School was never meant for creative people anyway. <clears throat> I did all right in science. Well, you <laughs> kind of have to do all right in science or else you blow something up. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you you graduate high school and then you decide you want to hitchhike? Is that, what, is that what happened? Or when did you decide to like travel the country? I think that was a product of uh, being a student of Milton Hershey. You're kind of living in a bubble. Mm. And you really don't know the real world. You see it on TV and hear it on the radio and read the newspaper. But your whole world is based on getting up in the morning. You're in, well, you you have a home, but it's part of the school. Like in my world, we get up, milk cows, go to school, come home, work, do your homework, go to bed. You know? It's kind of fun. We had to... (laughs) And when I look at today's kids and they, I hear some of the things they complain about, I remember that when I was a kid, we get up and before we could go do our chores, our real chores, we had to dust our room and make our beds and everything had to be in its place and neat. Yeah, I complain about that. <laughs> but I'm sure that I mean, sure, I'm sure that's that's uh, helpful because I wish sometimes I could do that. <laughs> I could like automatically do that. So, well, see, that was. That brings us to the answer to your question. Part of the thing to want to go hitchhiking when I did was to sort of erase all that, (laughs) all that stuff from myself (laughs) and, and um, undo everything that I had learned somehow become come free. Yeah. So tell me, what was that like? Uh, What were you at that point? Like an 18, 19 year old? I was probably 18 still, and I was going to college in Montgomery County, Maryland, Tacoma Park. And I was, you know, there for a couple months. And one day I just decided I have never experienced the world. And I didn't realize it. it's sort of like changing my name to J.C. Fallock. It's another one of those moments where if I could just, Pat Coon would have been a fine name for a comic strip artist. And Living the life I lived, going to college and everything, was an adventure. It was out of the bubble. It was, but my mind, I wanted to be some guy, let my hair go down to my butt, hitchhike all over the country, and be free. And that's what I did. You wanted to be a hippie, just to go around everywhere. Yeah, but we we didn't like that word. No? No. Nah, I think I, co- I consider myself a freak. <laughs> Not that's a better, that's better. <laughs> yeah. Somehow that was better. <laughs> it shows you the logic of it all right there. Right. Mm-hmm. So well, where'd you go? Where'd you go to hitchhike? I mean, you I, at some point you went to DC and got a guitar. Where else? No, that go? was because I actually lived in Bethesda. Oh, I see. And going into DC was a I I would hitchhike in there though. It did start by hitchhiking into DC and hanging out in there, but then how much detail do you want here? Sure, it's a story podcast. Tell me the story. All right, here's a little story. When I left home initially, I just got up, I packed everything I had into a, you know, a duffel bag is. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a big one from the service, from the army. And I filled it with everything, even pillows in my album collection, like 18 records, <laughs> my clothes and I didn't have a dog, but that would have been in there if I did. And uh, <laughs> I just, instead of really going anywhere, I would just went from Bethesda to downtown Washington, D.C., to George Washington University, and hung out and just lived there, like in the dorms and everything, for I don't know how long before it occurred to me, if I'm really going to hitchhike, I have to leave. <laughs> <some point. laughs> like, how, how can you miss me if you won't go away? And... uh I took, I, one day I went to my mom's house and unloaded three quarters of what was in that duffel bag and took more of what would fit in an actual backpack. And then, let me think, the first place I went was uh, Florida. Mm. I, I uh, hooked up with an old friend and we went down to Florida and it was hard. It's hard to be a hitchhiker. I don't recommend it. 
It's harder nowadays, too. With everyone on the- oh, I don't think you could do it at all today. Back then, yeah. people were used to seeing some kid with his kind of shaggy hair out there with his thumb out and a guitar and two dogs, you know, and they'd pick you up. Yeah. Nowadays, I almost got ran over because I was trying to hitchhike back to my house, back to Mannheim, because my, my car broke down. And some, some guy, like, ran me off the road, like, tried to hit, swerve into me. I was like, dude, what the heck? And not because he was stopping to pick you up. He no, was, he was just trying to hit me and I ran away. Yeah, in the I ended up doing that for like more than three years, and I found people were more often than not friendly mm-hmm. everywhere you went. And I expected some trouble when I was like in places like Oklahoma or Texas or something. But you know what? The thing, the rock and roll long hair thing was happening everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere I went, there was people who looked like me, you know, with the bell bottoms and <laughs> it looked like they were half asleep and stuff. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and so did you just go around playing music or what did you do? That was the goal was to everywhere I went, I would find someone that knew how to play a little guitar. And then right then, I mean, I knew literally. I didn't know how to play guitar. I knew three chords, and it was A minor and C, which are basically the same chord, and G. <laughs> so, and uh, but Wait, so by the end. time I got to California, I knew probably five chords, you know, mm. and and a couple different rhythms. But the flute was—I had already been playing flute for ten years by then, and and I could keep up with the flute when, when stuff happened. And everywhere I went, there was someone that knew how to play a little guitar, some girl that knew how to sing, and there would be, I don't know, That'd be it. campfire or whatever you got. So did you do any writing over that period, or was it just I was always sessions? writing. As a, uh, as a hitchhiker, I always took a journal book. It was like an artist's drawing pad, you know, with a mm-hmm. ring binder and thick paper, and I had the kind of pen you have to dip into ink. Right. And uh, I would write a little and then draw something and then make up a poem and then like that. And I kept a track of it. Do you still have it? No, uh, because when I got married and had kids and everything, I kind of, you know, got rid of a lot of my artifacts of that lifestyle. And but before I did, I read it, and you know, I don't. If I gave it to you, you couldn't understand a word of it. <laughs> it was just <laughs> my writing style is not very uh, cohesive. Let's just put it like that. So, you uh, you managed to get around. You after the, what? What made you stop hitchhiking? Well, in a way, I never did. I still Lancaster is a place I found while I was hitchhiking. I mean, you think because I went to Milton Hershey, oh, you know, it has something to do with that. Well, in a way, small way it does, but I never knew Lancaster or anything. I came here, there's another little story. <laughs> I was hitchhiking around. I ran into an old buddy from Milton Hershey, Bobby Grubb. He was our class valedictorian. And he goes, let's go see this band. So we went to Nevsville and saw a band called Custard's Last Man. They were immense. They were, had horns and guitar, and they could through Chicago or Jimi Hendrix. It was amazing. This band, vocal power. I mean, they had three awesome singers, and it was just amazing. And I somehow talked my way into a, an audition. And, and uh, ah, man, I don't want to get into the whole story, but the whole thing that happened with Custer's last band made me sort of stop hitchhiking for a minute. And I stopped here. And when you do that, you have to get a job or something. Because as a hitchhiker, you're going to be someone's house maybe a day, two days, and you move on. You stay longer than that. You should have a job or something, you know right. what I'm saying? And, and that happened. And But I kept hitchhiking. I, I'd get a job, but, you know, next winter, it starts to get cold, psh, San Diego. <laughs> and then I met my wife, who the woman who became my wife. I met her in San Diego. And she was kind of doing the same thing. There were a lot of us out there at the time. Yeah, I'm sure California is the place where... Exactly. It was that. kind of the destination for anybody like myself who thought we'd go out there. And as soon as you get there, you're Jed Clampett becoming a millionaire, you know, because, you know, a little flute or guitar, you have a song you wrote or something. And all you do is meet other people who went out there for the same reason. <laughs> 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 We're just basically street urchins, you know. But we didn't. I, 
I should say we, because it wasn't just me. It was a whole bunch of us. We didn't realize that we were not fulfilling our dream. We were doing what we were doing, and that was enough. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't know. I went back and forth like three times from the East Coast to the West Coast, up, up and down the East Coast a couple times. And uh, when, when I met my children's mother, we ended up in Lidditz at Speedwell Forge. We actually lived where the wolf sanctuary is now. Before they had wolves there, that was my yard. And uh, that's where my, we lived when my children were born. And I go there now, and they've got like 40-some wolves, and it's howling, and that, that was a nice place to live. <laughs> so I got to know, what, what, what did your parents think of all this? Well, I only had a mother, because my dad died. You have to have one or both parents dead to be at Milton Hershey. I see. So he, my dad died when I was two. That's probably the reason I was so broken in my whole way of growing up. Because then I was raised by Milton Hershey School. And living at Milton Hershey School, your mom's 200 miles away. She's not really the person who every day is going, why did you do that? And did you do your homework and all that? And here's dinner. And I didn't get that. Mm -hmm. Milton Hershey was my mom that way. And so my mom became the person who comes and takes you away for vacation. And the person who comes up and visits you on a Saturday afternoon. And the hero. And she didn't, she didn't get my normal 14-year-old wrath. Uh, that, that She's like, thank God mom's here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she had a whole different role because Milton Hershey got my, you know. I don't want to do this. When you turn 14, right. it's like you know more than everybody else. Oh, of course. And you're the smartest uh, person it in the room. And if you're in a thing like I was, it becomes, well, it's Milton Hershey that I know more than, not my mom. Mm. Well, I guess I knew more than her, too. But, <laughs> but she's all right. She's cool. Tell you, you know, it's like Mark Twain said. When you're about 21, you figure it out, and you realize you're the idiot. Not <laughs> that. <laughs> That's cool, man. Yes. So uh, you, you hit Lancaster. I'm running about when was that? 30 or something? You mean when I Age went or... to see... Uh, Hustler's last band. Or like when you settled around here. Or did you ever really settle around here? Yeah. Um, the first time I, I would say I kind of settled here would be, yeah, at Speedwell Forge that time. And no, I was probably like 22, 23. Oh, wow. This is really fast. Yeah. It was, it was like that's how the hitchhiking kind of moved into the next phase, which instead of hitchhiking, we would just move. Because we mm -hmm. lived at Speedwell for, I forget, three years or something. Then we moved to uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin. Then we moved to Minneapolis. Then me and the wife separated. And I stayed there for a while, came here, went back, you know, became the uh, weekend warrior dad instead of the mom and dad dad. Lived that life. And all that affects your music, your, of course. everything, everything. So, <laughs> <laughs> where's that leaving? Where, yeah, I, I'm curious why Wisconsin. That seems out of left field. My ex wife was from Mankato, Minnesota. Okay. Nice. Of Little House in the Prairie fame. And um, we decided to leave this area, and I, we, she wanted to move closer to her family. And I said, but I don't want to live where like your mom's in my living room when I come home from work for some reason. I look at that <laughs> now. That's another moment where thinking Pac Toon's not good enough and becoming JC felt like where I look at it now, it would be great to have the grandparents around close and everything. But for some reason, you know, part of my mentality at the time was, no, man, I want to have, we're us, and we'll go visit them, and they'll come here, but it's not going to be. It's not It's not a whole living situation. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, this is like uh, the Howard Stern show, the way it is now, is where he psychoanalyzes everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what fits into the weave of what we're talking about is within there, before I got married and had the kids, I was I found a guru, which I, yes, uh, you, you mentioned, mentioned that. And I mean, he was a 12 year old kid from India who had millions of people who would basically worship him. They would really 
kiss his feet, literally. Wow. And he taught this meditation that when I look back on it, my whole life today, the, what I learned from him, I consider still now to be the most important thing I ever learned. Which is? It, it's an inward meditation. You can learn to go all the way inside and see at a light and hear music and have this experience that uh, transcends like your daily life. And you got to focus in on it and everything. And to learn it back in the day, we thought, oh, he's some kind of, you know, bow down before him and he teaches you thing. And it, there was this whole transformation where he started thinking that when he, he was taught to be that way from childhood. He was eight when he became the guru. This is, this is not off topic here. Right. And uh, it's just going to take a while to get back to the thing. But at the time I started following him, and you learn these meditations, and I'm telling you, these meditations are real, that inside you, maybe you know already by some other technique you've learned to get there, you have a place inside you that where it's all peaceful. It's very calm. And if you're in a dark room, you can still see a bright light that beams. It's the core of every atom, what you get when you split the atom. And we're made of atoms. It's the cosmic whatever. But the second you have a thought of any kind, it goes away. So you have to clear your mind for however long you want to be there, which is pretty close to impossible. Yeah, right. But you can. And I, all right, I'm back to what we're really talking about. I consider that to be something I still do virtually every day and try to put it into how I treat people and how I do my music and how everything is what I eat, everything. Now, when I followed him, that's what everybody thought. And we, we, it's kind of like, he's God for teaching you that. And then when he gets to be, I don't know how old, he, he finally, and this is after I, I quit following him and going to the festivals and all that and had a different kind of music going on, but still meditated. And he, as a human being, goes, you know what? I can't be what they've been telling me I am. I can't be a divine character. That's impossible. Mm -hmm. And he became an alcoholic and started becoming a mean to his children and his wife. And somehow he passed through all that and became now what he is, is he's a guy who uses his real name instead of guru, whatever, whatever. His name is Prem Paul Singh Rawat. And he says, I can teach you this meditation that can really show you a peaceful place and you're going to love it. But you can learn it on the internet. You can learn it from a book. You can learn it from some other guy who calls himself a guru too. For me, it's free and I'll just show you. And that's that. And he dropped all the, pretense of anything being spiritual about it and man i look at it now and i go that that's kind of what happened to me 20 years ago with it where i still meditate but i don't do any of the trappings about it you know worshiping anything or anybody about it but anyway how does this fit into the this is where this part of my um I don't know, this might be totally ego, but to me, the whole purpose of being a musician is because there is that light. And when you play your music, it's in the music. And if you can touch someone else with the light and make them just for a second forget that today some horrible thing happened or they got cussed at or they were mad or someone else was mad at them or they lost something or just looking at the news or whatever there is to be upset about, all of a sudden they had a reason to laugh or go, wow, that was pretty cool or something like that, or clap, you know? And so you do that nowadays. You uh, you work with uh, Music for Everyone. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, this is an amazing project. I can't take any credit other than just being one little musician in this network of amazing stuff that goes on. and. Um, there's another organization called Right Face. And Right Face is the organization that's right there involved with the veterans. And it's like what, right what it sounds like. Right is W-R-I-T-E, Right mm. Face. 
and it is specifically for veterans who have something to say. And, you know, art's not necessarily the thing that's been jammed down everybody's throat all their life, especially maybe for a while it was being a soldier or being a, you know, pilot or whatever. And now people have things to say and they have things they want to get off their chest. And uh, here's this organization that comes along and goes, me too, and I didn't know how to do it. So I started doing this and then I did that. And now we have this and people go, wow, that's cool. And every year it gets bigger. And so what the different veterans I've seen, they have so many different things to say. And it, it isn't always about some military thing or war or anything. Sometimes it's about going fishing, you know. But you do get a taste of what some of the horrible things about being in different situations are. Mm -hmm. And then they'll, bring, they'll come in with these words and these thoughts and these feelings. And we got some just great people, Dave Lefevre and Lisa Fairman and Scott Howard. Oh, it's just so beautiful. They take all this stuff and we'll have Native American music and hip hop and stuff I do. And, and uh, at the end of the hour on uh, Veterans Day, you feel like you have just heard so many different things, so many different points of view, so many important feelings. That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, are you going to be involved in that this year? Well, I think I am. We've been having classes for certain people who want to get involved, but they have no idea how to write a song. So we mm -hmm. just had this Zoom every Wednesday night, a Zoom meeting where we get together. And there was like a, it was kind of like a classroom where they gave us all an assignment. And every week you come back and do, the, do your assignment. And now we're in the sort of a more like a fermenting stage where people are taking that and writing their stuff. And soon we'll be getting back in touch with each other and writing music. And by November, there will have been many practices and all kinds of things will have happened, you know. That'd be really cool. I'll be sure to check that out. Uh, what's the organization's name? Right Face. Right Face is our Right Face is for the veterans who want to speak their mind, and then music for everybody. And we're a, that, we're part of that it's music for vets. Yeah. And uh, it's all on the internet. It's all part of under the MFE umbrella, so it's easy to find. And um, if there are any vets out right now that are hearing my voice who have ever even considered this, please get involved. It's I've said enough already, but I'll be music for everyone, veterans. And I'm sure it's very therapeutic to those guys, too. Yeah, you know it is. So uh, right now you're currently working on a, a band Wild Self, and you, you have, you've got a few projects going on right now. You have Wild Self, you have um, Melissa Lianza and yourself, yeah. and you got a jazz band as well. I don't know if that's jazz. It's more like neo classic or something like that. Tell but me about Wild Self though. Wild Self is Patrick White, who's a amazing bass player. Uh, Rick Kahn, who's a I don't know what you might call a progressive stylist of a guitar player. Joel Abler, who's my buddy, a uh, reggae-feeling ukulele guitar player, singer, and myself. And, um, I mean, we get gigs and we do things, but to me it feels like, you know how there's people that get together Wednesday night and play poker? Well, we get together Tuesday night and write songs and practice the songs we've already written. Mm. And that's what it feels like. Just a bunch of friends that get together and every once in a while we get like play moon dance or winery or somebody's party or something like that and get to show the world what we've been doing. And is that the the band that made Love Bomb or No Love Bomb oh. is what happened with Love there is no actual Love Bomb band. I went in the studio, Chad Kinsey, bless you, Chad. He's having some health issues at the moment. Mm. Um, he has studios and he was producing it and as I would come in 
I'd play my song and uh, we'd go, who do we want on this particular song? And when you, and um, we sort of tailor-made every song for, I would say it's our group of friends. It's people we both know. And um, we put the CD together one person at a time where I came in first. Then the drummer came in, then the bass player came in, all pretty much separately, all the background vocals and everything. And there never was a band yeah. un until it came time to do the Long's Park gig. And then I got those same people, and we practiced a bunch of times so that we could actually go out there and do it together. And that's what Long's Park is. And we did that a couple of times. We did that at Telus 360, too, where the band got together. And I, I love everybody in the band um, for doing it. And every one of them is just an awesome star in the in the like, right. music scene on their own right. You know what I mean? So tell me about the songwriting process. We have one of your, uh, we have well, we have two of your songs. Uh, the first one being "I Need Your Love." What was the songwriting process on that? Was it was it you? Was it everybody? Was it no? Was it? I need your love. All these songs are mine that I had to like train the band. <laughs> and I need your love is a song that. Uh, it's the third set of lyrics over this thing where I wrote it one time and it had some words. I forget what they were. And I, I guess I dumped those words and made this other song called ice cream lady. <laughs> and, and, uh, the ice cream lady was like, I don't know. It was okay and everything, but, I need your love sort of grew out of it. And be, as it grew out of it, I, ice cream lady became less and less and less. But then this version of it, I believe it does at the end kind of sneak in there a little bit, ice cream lady, but then it goes back to, I need your love. So with all that said, this is JC Fenlock's I need your love. <laughs> Oh, 
getting stronger. What would I do if the ice cream lady? Yeah, the ice cream lady. Cause I can't promise we will be best friends. I can't guarantee. and crime share the line First she takes your money and then she breaks your heart I'm coming to 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 And you need my love. And that was DC Fetlock's I Need Your Love. Yeah, that sounds like an actual band, but you're telling me that it didn't really, it wasn't like that. You all recorded it one at a time. Yeah, me first on guitar, then we'd um, bring a drummer in, Paul Murr. Thank you, Paul. You did a wonderful job. Then we bring bass in. Every song has this in common that Paul and Mike Fitz. Mike Fitz. Mike Fitz on bass, every song. And fantastic job from both of them. And there were more than just musicians, both of them directed and did different things and when we did the live versions and helped me with practices and all kinds of things as long as chat too as well as chat and then we'd bring in whoever we're going to have every guitar player might be different on each song but right sweet and uh so we have one of your live versions that you did at longwoods park uh the the car one i can't remember the whole name of it that's my car that's my car <laughs> So tell me a little bit about that one, because that's a real story that you have. Yeah, it's a story. I think <laughs> I don't have to tell. If I tell you anything about it, it'll be like, uh, you know, it's in the song is what I'm trying to say. It's all there. I tell the whole thing. Well, with all that said, this is That's My Car on DC Fetlock. Live at Long Park. Just the other day In the middle of the night My neighbor stuck her head in my door And she, she called my name out loud Jesse. She said Man, your car's on fire I walked it to my window What? Do I see? Street, feel the heat, feel the night, 
religious significance of this event, I'd like to explain it to you. This was no ordinary car. This was a real automobile. A 1972 Chevrolet Impala made of solid steel. I was amazed they could set this thing on fire, but they did. It was pea green and had a vinyl top. It was fast and it was quick. I'm telling you, I really love that car. I really love that car. I really love yes, that car. Really really love that car. It took me everywhere. Took him near, took him far. Took him everywhere he went. I love that car. I held the man so. and he quit it. He really loved that car. Yes, he really, really loved that car. Yeah. Took him near, took him far. Now, while I got your attention, I'd like to introduce everybody up here. The band and the equipment. This is Steve Sauer on the keyboards. And these beautiful singers I just interrupted. Jessica Smucker who's obviously with child. It's not JC's child. Thanks for ruining everybody's image tricks. I mean, it's Loretta. And that's Loretta, the comedian in the middle over there. Everybody loves Loretta. Trixie Griner here. Yeah. 
on guitar, the fantastic guitar lead and mandolin, Matt Underhill. Way back there hiding from us, Ken McCoy on saxophone. And the electronic French horn. Right here, Mike Bitts on bass. Captain John Flavin way in the back. Joe Abler. My son Isaac disappeared. James Lipko on guitar. And last, because he held the whole thing together all night, Paul Murr. Thank you, everybody. Farewell. He really loved that car. Bye bye. Yes, he really, really loved that car. Bye bye. Took him near, took him far. He loved that car. Took him everywhere he went. He held the band and the equipment. Farewell. And that's my car. <laughs> I hope everybody's awake, Kevin. <laughs> so we're kind of running out of time here on the radio. If anybody has any questions to ask JC while we still have some time left, please be sure to comment them down below. We'll get around to them. These are questions I like to ask all my guests that I have on. So tell me, what is, out of all of your experiences, I mean, that's you brought together a bunch of musicians to uh, – Work on your songs. I'm glad we picked a song where I get to mention everybody. Yeah. Hey, every one of you, you're not just musicians on there, you're my friends and I love you. And that was fantastic hearing that today. And that was really that was really cool because I'm, I'm I don't know if you saw this, but I'm starting up a similar thing, uh collaborative songwriting sessions where I'm getting all of my previous guests and whoever really wants to join us. Oh yeah. To to get together around here. We're gonna uh I'm not. I'm not exactly sure of the format, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna write a song within an hour, and we're gonna have multiple different people from around the central PA. Your your country singers, your metal singers, your folk singers, your whatever singers and uh, songwriters and musicians. We're gonna come together, workshop hard for one hour on a song, and hopefully by the end of the year we'll have an album that with of all people across everywhere working all together. To make some new interesting music. So, if you'd like to be a part of that collaborative songwriting, I would. Uh, well, I'll, I'll get. I'll send you a link, All right. and you can go to CoreyRosenProductions.com. The Story Podcast is there. You can check out the links there, and uh, that that link will be up soon on that website. Hopefully by today or tomorrow. If not, you can just DM me. It, I mean, most of these people know who I am. I'm Corey Rosen. You can find me on Facebook. You can just DM me. Hey, I want to be a part of that. Or go to the post on the story podcast and say, hey, I want to be a part of that. I'll send you a link. And we'll, we'll get that started. So for you, last questions that I have. What is one thing that you know now that you wish you had known when you first started in your music career? I don't think there's anything that I wish I knew. I think I knew everything back then. I just wish I practiced what I knew, you know? Mm. You, you do, you're set up in school. Your parents, everybody gives you all the right direction you need. And it's uh, kind of up to you to do it. Which way on the road you're going to go? Are you going to, you know, keep your name or change it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so true. I mean, cause... I, even like college students, they they're given all of this. They're given like for for me. I went to this school. I have all of this stuff uh, at my fingertips. That I, I all I have to do is ask. Yet I never asked until I'm I'm now an alumni at the school, and I get to I, I ask, and they still let me use it, which is great. Yeah. But when you when you're going to some place, make sure you take advantage of where you're going. Yeah, it's um, 
there's a concept I've become aware of recently called future self, mm. and present self, and past self, and and think now about the things you're doing to set up the guy, the future you, with the right stuff. Right. Because <laughs> that's a, that's the thing a lot of a lot of at least in America people have seen the lost is uh, investment uh, long term planning. Because you can't. You can't be one of the best pianists in the world if you're not practicing seven hours a week, or at least, right? Yeah. You can't get anywhere without putting the time in now. It's a, it's a large investment, and it's going to suck, but it's going to pay off. He's like, yeah, I got nothing to add to that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I do. I'm thinking that it's like if I could look back on 14-year-old me, which uh, – it would be something like you got to realize that all the things you're doing now, that's like who you're going to be. And so you got to take it serious, learn. It's not like they're teaching you one plus one equals two just to take up time. You're going to need that someday. Because <laughs> <laughs> right. soon enough, two plus two equals four, and then four plus four equals eight. All of it. And it grows exponentially from there. Yes. So make sure you learn, uh, practice your basics. Cross your T's, <laughs> dot your Q's. Right, well, however it goes, right? <laughs> um, so what you, uh, you, you're you killing it on the pan flute. How, is there any more techniques that you want to learn or anything more do you want to do at 71 years old? What what left, What <laughs> is there more to do for you? What more do you oh, want to do? Oh, there's tons to do. Uh, pan flute is, oh, I haven't even scratched the surface on that one. I want to have another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that that was a silver flute that one uh, on both the songs we had here. You'll have to bring one in that, like, next time that I have you on because that'd be really. I've never. I, I I've seen them, but I've never seen them. You know, used right. I tell you what, you do go down to Inner Harbor sometime, and there's always these guys with real Peruvians down there, and they got about four of them, and the way they play them, the real dudes. Like one guy plays two notes, and then the other guy plays two notes, and 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 they make a melody where it's sort of like a bell choir. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, it, and it's really it's spiritual. That's really cool. <laughs> so, uh, what's next for JC? I'm gonna keep working on that music for vets thing. Oh. I'm working with a young lady. She's a songwriter. I'm a songwriter, Melissa Lianza. We just did a gig at Moondancer Winery Saturday. And um, we're going to continue putting stuff out. What we do is she has her songs. I don't. You don't touch them, really. I just add a little guitar to it or yeah. sing, sing a harmony to it. And then she'll do the same for me. Where it's So far, it's working real nice. And then I had this other thing that we somehow I don't, I think maybe we did sort of mention it earlier, the neoclassical thing with Eric Eby and Pat White, where we, uh, Eric's in charge of it. Eric picks the songs and we do, I, I wish I would have brought some way of you hearing that. Because we uh, need that next time too. Okay. <laughs> I'm setting you up to get yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Part two. Come on, but that's real. Um, a real soft, beautiful music where it's just bass, classical guitar, and flute. We don't sing anything. There's no, it's just that combination all throughout. Do you have any shows coming up? You know, actually at this moment, no. Hmm. So if you want to book JC. Yeah, hey, yeah, I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can find JC. Uh, you don't have a website or anything. I have my Facebook page. It's... JC Fetlock. You can go over there. He is on Spotify. That link should be in the description. And if you want to check out all of that stuff, we'll we'll find a link for the music for everyone, veteran stuff, and put that down there too. Yeah, because I I want to be I want to I want to research that a little. Yeah, bit you should. Um, I'm not that would that was I don't know. Should's well. the right word, but it would be interesting for you to find out more about that. Yeah. And Mary, I see you're listening. Tell us Tyrion's last name. This is a musician. Uh, I wish you would be. Oh yeah, to, uh, yeah. That's that's the hip hop guy, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I, so you know already. Julian Mac, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm I'm trying to work. 
There are so many people I'm trying to get. In. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. There's only so many hours in that. <laughs> But if you know about him, that's really exciting. I think it's good to get some what's going on right now with. Oh yeah, with uh, him, Sir Dominic Jordan. And yeah, so I've all had right. Him, I've had Beautiful. him on. Yep. Yeah, I, I've had. Uh, I'm really getting into the hip hop scene around here because it's hopping, and it's hipping. <laughs> and the spoken word thing. And too. the spoken word thing. Yeah, right. Nice. So, we're running out of our time. It's been a pleasure to have you on, JC. I Is can't there wait. Are any questions from anybody? Um, nobody wants to know anything. I'm sorry, man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, people, you, you talk for an hour. People are like, what do I ask? Yeah, what yeah, I mean, we said it all. Said it all. God, man. Get what? rid of that guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure having you on, man. Thank I, you. I'm excited to have you on next time and talk to you more about the, the jazz uh, con- or the contemporary stuff and uh, the, the Melissa Leanne stuff and all that. Maybe you yeah, can give me something about that and the the pan flute, which we, the flute stuff, which we we really didn't even dive into yeah. all that much because there's so much technique there that we could we could just fly off into. Because uh, I I really want to know about that because you you got you got a way around the flute with you. So with Thank that you. said, Thank yeah, you. you're welcome. <laughs> with that said, this is Cor- I am Corey Rosen. This is the Story Podcast. You can find out more about me at CoreyRosenProductions.com. That's C O R Y R O S E N Productions.com. Find out about my personal projects and the story podcast, all 100. You're, a, you're number 140 of the, nice. of the episode. That's so my far. second favorite number. <laughs> 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 so you can check out all previous guests before that. This weekend, we have Zach Entman of the Spiders of Harrisburg, a, a band out of Harrisburg. They're coming over to talk to us. And then this Sunday, we have Cody Smith at 2 p.m. He is a uh, local country artist around here. And then that night, uh, they have Conrad Fisher's concert over in uh, – oh, I'm forgetting exactly where it is. But he has a concert. He's a really cool guy, uh, a Christian singer-songwriter. So if you're, if you're into that, please go check out Conrad Fisher. Uh, he's also up for a CPMA, so that's also cool. And then next Monday, we have Glenn Hollenbach. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. He's a, a great guitarist. He works with Stephanie Grace, and he works with a bunch of other artists in the area, and he's got his own stuff going on. So I'm excited to talk to him and get the details on all that. With all that said, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day, and we will see you guys later. Bye. <laughs>